Hey guys, welcome to AP Biology in the Gene to Protein Lecture Series. This is lecture number two, and we are going to be talking about translation. And in this particular picture, I do want you to notice that we do have the main players in this particular uh uh, step. We see the ribosome, which is the large green structure com composed of two parts, the small and large subunit. We see the messenger RNA molecule moving from left to right through the ribosome. Not quite exactly how it does it. And then we see another thing called the tRNA or transfer RNA. RNA. And also exiting the ribosome, we see the uh, protein coming on out. So I just wanted you to um, see those and uh, what's happening here. And, okay, so how does messenger RNA code for proteins? Again, um, there are approximately 20 amino acids, and I say approximately because we assume uh, in AP biology that there are 20 amino acids that all living organisms on the planet do share. However, there are a couple of uh, exceptions to that, very small with uh, um, extreme bacteria. And uh, we're just going to ignore that for the time being, okay? But anyways, there are 20 amino acids amongst the thousands of amino acids that do exist, but all life uses this small subset of 20 amino acids. But there are only four nucleotide bases. Uh, there's adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine in DNA. And in RNA, it's adenine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine. So how can this uh, messenger RNA with only four letters code for 20 different amino acids? Okay. And that was an, a major question uh, that was going in into the 1960s, but, you know, about 10 years after the discovery of the structure of DNA. So again, we're going to be looking at this step. We've already talked about transcription, producing the messenger RNA, and how do we go from the messenger RNA into a protein? All right. Uh, well, the guy who took this on was a, a scientist by the name of Marshall Nirenberg. And uh, with their discovery of their work, which was published, I think, in the early 1960s, mid-1960s, by 1968, they got the Nobel Prize in Physiology for breaking the genetic code. Pretty cool stuff. Okay, so how did they do this? Well, the first thing they did was they used a cell-free act. Uh, extract. Basically, in that cell-free extract, they had all of the components needed for building proteins, but there was no DNA or RNA in there. So there was uh, ribosomes, there were transfer RNAs, there were uh, amino acids and all sorts of stuff in there. Everything needed to make proteins, and all they had to do was add some artificially created RNA, messenger RNA. And they started off by um, introducing a messenger RNA that consisted solely of uracil. So it's this long str str uh, string of uracils. Okay. And when they added that to uh, the test tubes, the only thing that came out was phenylalanine. So long chains of amino acids of phenylalanine stuck together. So what that told them is somehow uracil coded for phenylalanine. What didn't it not tell them was how many amino acids, or excuse me, how many nucleotides were needed to code for one amino acid. That was the question. But that was actually solved pretty easily by math. Okay. And let me just jump back here. Let's think about it. If one amino acid coded for, excuse me, if one nucleotide coded for one amino acid, then the maximum number of amino acids you would be able to have would be four. You, uracil, excuse me, um, yeah, uh, uracil would code for phenylalanine. Uh, adenine would code for another uh, amino acid such as proline. And cytosine would code for another one such as lysine. And guanine might code for another one. You'd only have four amino acids, vastly short of the 20 that you would need. So if it took two amino acids to code for a uh, uh, 
to code, excuse me, if it took two nucleotides to code for an amino acid, then the maximum number of amino acids that could be coded for with four bases would be 16. How did I figure that out? It's you have four bases and you have um, two different combinations you could have. So that'd be four to the second power or four times four, which would equal 16. Still not enough. So they hypothesized that it must be three. Okay, four to the third power would equal 64, and that would be more than enough to code for the 20 amino acids. And you can click on that link when you open up your um, uh, your, your lecture uh, slides that are in Schoology. Uh, click on that little link, and it'll be a little short two-minute video about that process. Okay, so they figured out that it was blocks of three nucleotides decoded sequence of amino acids. UGG codes for tryptophan, UUU called codes for phenylalanine, GGC coded for glycine, and they figured out very quickly uh, the um, that you know I think it was uh, that AAA coded for proline, CCC coded for lysine, but GGG did not code for anything. Then they had to go through and start figuring out all of the other codons it took a lot. So one of the things um, scientists realized, though, so that the genetic code must have evolved very early in the history of life. And why do we know that? Well, first of all, it's nearly universal, meaning that a bacterial ribosome could read the messenger RNA of a human and make the protein if all the necessary other ingredients were there, the necessary amino acids and so on. Or a human cell could take a bacterial messenger RNA, read it, and make the bacterial protein. Very simple. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. And in order for that to happen, this genetic code had to evolve very early in the history of life and then had been passed down successfully through all the various iterations of cell replication and mutations and so on and so on. And again, we can take genes, uh, we can take uh, messenger RNAs from one species, we can implant those genes or messenger RNAs into another species, and those proteins are going to be coded. Now I have a picture of this little green bunny, that's ALBA. And if you take ALBA, what they did was, is they took a GFP gene, green fluorescent protein, which is isolated from jellyfish, and they put it into ALBA, the bunny. And when ALBA goes to the rave party under the UV lights, the black lights, he glows green. Now, this has been done in uh, monkeys, it's been done in mice, it's been done in pigs, and you can take a little break right now and Google some of these, look up GFP organisms, okay, or glowing organisms, and you can even go to the uh, pet store and buy GFP and GFB, which is, uh, uh, or not GFB, but BFP, which would be blue fluorescent protein, or RFP, red fluorescent protein, and find fish uh, in the uh, pet store that this has been done. These are called transgenic organisms, okay? And again, that near universality of the genetic code must have been operating very early in the history of Earth. And again, a reminder of common origin for all life. So here's the code, okay? Um, you will know, you will need to know how to read this chart and you will need to know how to read other charts. And for one thing, let's, uh, let's, let's look at it broadly. What do we see here? We see that there are 64 codes and we can see up here in the very top right hand corner, we see that UUU, as we said, learned earlier, codes for the amino acid phenylalanine, but so does UUC. So it, it is redundant. There are more than one code that codes for the same amino acids. Same for leucine. If you look at leucine, it has six different codes. Okay. There's only a few that have a single code. Um, the AUG, which is methionine, or also known as the start codon, and then tryptophan, where's tryptophan, tryptophan, TRP, tryptophan, tryptophan. Oh, it's right here. Here's TRP. It only has a single amino acid or single code also. 
But most of the other ones have double codes or uh, quadruplets or something or even greater than that. Um, so why is that a good thing? Think about that. Why would it be good to have multiple codons for the same amino acid? Now think back to the difference between DNA polymerase and the difference between RNA polymerase. Okay, and you will answer that question. All right. Um, I do want you also to notice that there, the start codon is AUG. And what does that mean? That means that that will begin or commence the beginning of every uh, messenger RNA will be AUG. Okay, and that will be the amino, also code for the amino acid methionine. Now, that doesn't mean it cannot appear later on in the protein. It can begin, it can appear at the beginning of the protein, but it can also be in the middle of the protein too. So you can have multiple AUGs, but there must be one at the start of that particular messenger RNA molecule. And at the end, at the termination site, you have to, ha you have, to have one of these three stop codons, UAA, UAG and UGA. And none of these code for an amino acid. It's codes for basically for the ribosome to disassemble once it reaches that uh, stop codon. Here's a circular. Oh, let me go back real quickly. So how do you read this chart? Well, if I gave you the codon, let's say uh, CUG, how would you read that? Well, the first base, the five prime end is C. So that means I'm going to be somewhere in this row. Now, the second base up here is U, C, U, G. So that means I'm going to be right in here. And the third letter is right there. And there I am, C, U, G. So let's try um, A, A, G. We go down to A. We go over to A. There it is right there, A, A, G. And it codes for the amino acid lysine. So now you know how to read that code, that chart. Here's a circular chart. This one's a little easier, in my opinion, to read. We have the first base, the second base, and the third base. So let's say I give you GCC. So you go to G, you go to C, and you would see it's right there. It's alanine. How about uh, UGG? You go U, G, G, tryptophan. So now you know how to read the circular chart. Uh, you may also see um, a, a chart with one letter amino acid code. I do want you to just realize there, you'll see multiple ones. This is just like the first chart we looked at, first base, second base, and third base. So if you had AAA, you would go here and then here, and there it is right there. Lysine, do notice that the single word or single key uh, letter for lysine is K. Sometimes they don't really make sense. I'm not sure why, but phenylalanine is F. That makes sense. Leucine is L. Isoleucine is I. Methionine is M. Valine is V. Most of these do make sense. Okay. Um, but that's the way it works. So just wanted to show you that. It's my dog. So how are the codons read? Remember, uh, RNA polymerase is going to read the DNA in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction, ELSA stop. The messenger RNA, again, has to be built in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. And the ribosome will always read it from the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, which is a little bit different than we saw with DNA polymerase, or excuse me, RNA polymerase. The ribosome is going to read in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction in order to build the protein, methionine, arginine, valine. Again, there's my stop start codon, AUG, and there's my amino acid, methionine. And remember, this is all taking place in the ribosome. So the messenger RNA is called, the triplets in the messenger RNA is called the codon. And we're going to talk about transfer RNAs, and they also have triplets, and the transfer RNAs carry the amino acids to the ribosome. And uh, the transfer RNA triplet is called the anti-codon. And do notice that it does base pair with the codon. And we also see directionality in the, in the codon and in the anti-codon. Five prime N, three prime N, five prime N, three prime N, so on and so on. Okay. So again, 
um, in the process of translation, which is occurring in the ribosome, we see that the ribosome is reading the codons. Uh, the transfer RNAs are bringing the amino acids in. They are base pairing according to base pairing rules. Okay, and here's the five prime end of the messenger RNA. Here's the three prime end. And we see the anticodons come in. They carry their transfer RNA. They base pair. The uh, amino acids are um, going to be joined in forming a peptide bond uh, inside the ribosome. And then after the amino acid is removed from the transfer RNA, the transfer RNA is released and it goes back out in order to get recharged with another amino acid. So what is a transfer RNA? It is a single stranded RNA molecule that base pairs to itself to form this three-dimensional structure where the three prime end does carry the amino acid. Okay, and we have the section down here, which is where the uh, anticodon is that's going to pair with the codon inside of the ribosome. So how do the transfer RNAs get recharged? Well, there's an enzyme in the cytoplasm called amino acid tRNA synthase. And basically, what does it do? It takes the amino acid and it's going to take the uh, transfer RNA, okay? And it's going to combine these two together. And you can see that there's phosphates involved in this because we're making a bond, which is going to require some energy. And basically, uh, it is uh, created and it is released, okay? Um, I do want you to notice that, again, the transfer RNA amino acid bond is unstable because there's energy in there. So it kind of wants to get rid of that pretty quick, which it does very quickly. It also gets charged really quickly. So they're, co they're constantly being resynthesized. Again, what is a ribosome? Well, a ribosome is a structure that's made up of rRNA, ribosomal RNA, and a variety of proteins. I think it's like 40 different proteins in prokaryotes and about 35 in eukaryotes are kind of held together into this large structure, which is almost like an enzyme in a way, but it's an enzyme that's made up of multiple proteins and this ribosomal RNA. It does come in two parts, a small part subunit, uh, which is on the bottom here, and a large subunit. And if these are not connected to each other, then that ribosome is non-functional, okay? And the, inside the ribosome, there are three binding sites. Uh, I like to call it EPA, or the, you know, the easy way for me to remember that is Environmental Protection Agency. And uh, A stands for the arrival site. P stands for the protein binding site or the peptide binding site. And E is the exit site. So the, the transfer RNAs arrive into the arrival site. They uh, transfer their amino acid to a growing polypeptide chain in the P site. And now the empty uh, tRNA will go to the E site and then be ejected out of the ribosome. Okay. And there's just all of the uh, information that I just said. You can pause and look at that uh, if you need it to, if you need to. So again, uh, building polypeptide, three stages, initiation, elongation, and termination. The first stage is going to be initiation. And that's when the messenger RNA and its start codon binds to the small ribosomal subunit. At that point, an initiator, transfer RNA, which carries the methionine, binds to it. And that's when we're going to see the large sub, the large ribosomal subunit now bind to the small one and make a functional ribosome. And then basically elongation is the messenger RNA is going to be pulled through this ribosome. And as you can just follow through, a uh, new transfer RNA comes in. Um, we see the transfer of the bond, the peptide bond formation. Um, and then this one's going to move to the E site and then out. It's kind of a little funky, but the peptide bond formation does for, take place in the P site. So that's not a very good diagram. I don't like it. Okay. 
And then the termination, that's when the polypeptide is released. The ribosome breaks up into the small and large subunits. And then that protein is going to go on to a variety of different possibilities. It's either, first of all, it's not going to be in its correct shape. It's, it hasn't folded. It's not going to, it's going to begin to unfold, to, excuse me, it's going to begin to fold as it's coming out of the ribosome. But oftentimes that protein is still a pretty rough job. A lot of stuff still has to be done to it. And we're going to talk about that in another lecture, all the different things that can happen to that protein. Uh, you can click on um, that uh, uh, um, link at the bottom of this particular slide and see a really cool animation on, on that. Okay, so if we put it all together, what do we see? We see transcription occurring in the nucleus. We're going to see RNA processing, which I'm going to talk about in another lecture, occurring in the nucleus. And then the mature messenger RNA leaves through a nuclear pore, goes into the cytoplasm, binds to the small ribosomal subunit, then the process of initiation. We see the uh, transfer RNA carrying methionine bind to that start codon. We see the large sub -rib large ribosomal subunit then bind to that um, initiation complex, and we now have a complete uh, ribosome. And then we go ahead and build that particular protein according to those messenger RNA instructions. What are the instructions? It's the sequence of nucleotides, or even we can use our new uh, term, a codon. It is the sequence of codons on the messenger RNA that will dictate the sequence of amino acids. And that sequence of amino acids will dictate the shape of that protein. And the shape of that protein will dictate the function of that protein. So as you can see, any changes in any one of those steps could potentially alter uh, the structure and function of that particular protein. Okay, so what happens to the, to the messenger RNA after a protein is made? Well, uh, other ribosomes can attach to it. As long as that messenger RNA remains inside the cell, then ribosomes are going to attach to it and continue to read it and make more and more protein. So if that messenger RNA is not is, is, is somehow not neutralized, then that cell will make and continually make a lot of that particular protein. I do also want you to notice that there can be multiple ribosomes on a single messenger RNA moly, uh, molecule. Okay, and this is called a polyribosome. All right, and the other thing I want to review with you is remember, once again, the steps of transcription and translation are separate in a eukaryotic organism. Remember, transcription takes place inside the nucleus. Translation occurs in the cytoplasm. Different place, different time. And as we will see in an upcoming lecture, that causes lots of interesting things to occur. However, in a prokaryote, because there is no nucleus, uh, there is simultaneous transcription and translation in prokaryotes. So I want you to think about that a little bit. Um, remember something about eukaryotic DNA. What does eukaryotic DNA have that prokaryotic DNA lacks. Okay. And again, that will uh, be made um, clear in our next lecture. Okay. And the last thing I want to talk about is protein targeting. Now, this will only be in eukaryotes because in eukaryotes, there are basically two places where that messenger RNA can be fully translated. One would be on a free-floating ribosome in the cytoplasm, and the other one would be on a ribosome attached to a, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Well, how does the messenger RNA know where to go? Well, at the very beginning of that particular protein, right after the methionine, there will be a series of amino acids, excuse me, that there will be a series of codons that code for a series of amino acids that uh, code for what we call a signal peptide. Okay. And 
peptide just means a series of few, a few amino acids, okay? But they are unique. Uh, signal recognition particle, which is another protein, will bind to that. And when that happens, then that ribosome and its associated messenger RNA will be dragged into the uh, endoplasmic reticulum where it will attach. And then that protein will finish its translation inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. See, we have the uh, ribosome is sitting on the outside of the endoplasmic reticulum, but the protein is being translated into the lumen or the interior of the endoplasmic reticulum. And it, there's a big difference in where that, what happens to those proteins uh, depending upon where they are translated. A protein that is translated in the cytoplasm generally does not need complex folding. It does not need much modification, um, and it will be used directly by the cell inside that particular cell. However, a protein that is translated inside of the endoplasmic reticulum is a protein that's going to be oftentimes heavily modified. It might be cut up into small pieces, pieces might be added to it, another protein might be added to it for that quaternary structure. It could be transported and secreted and become part of a membrane protein on the outside of the cell, or it might be excreted out of the cell, uh, or it could be packaged into something like a lysosome and be a hydrolytic uh, enzyme, or it might be bound for the nucleus. So usually proteins that are translated inside the endoplasmic reticulum are going to have a series of modifications made to them, and many of those proteins will be bound for transport out of the cell. And that's today's lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and um, I will see you soon.